Good evening everyone. Today we will start discussing variable, variable frequency response analysis. So uh, the idea is that uh, we are familiar at this point with looking at a circuit. Let me represent the circuit as a black box and, and, uh, and uh, doing AC analysis essentially on a circuit. AC analysis on a circuit. AC analysis has to do with analyzing the circuit for forcing functions that are at a fixed operating at a fixed frequency. So I could have like a, a voltage source, for example, and I'm then analyzing uh, the output voltage, right? And and uh, uh, the voltages I'm, I'm I'm analyzing are all or currents or signals I'm analyzing are all phasors because I'm doing AC analysis. So I could have an input voltage VS. Uh, phaser and I get an output voltage and I can I know how to do that analysis right and up to this point we did this AC analysis for a fixed AC frequency but notice that there is nothing in the in, in the tools that we established to do AC analysis that depends on the frequency meaning that the analysis is general enough that we can repeat the same analysis for different frequencies and get different numbers Right? So we can, you, we can do an AC analysis for every single frequency that we're interested in, meaning we can sweep across all frequencies. Frequencies. Right? Using the same techniques that we've already learned. I mean, there will be nothing new there except acknowledging that we can sweep across all frequencies. So I could, for example, do AC analysis on this circuit. So I might have some circuit here, some random circuit. I, I don't care what it looks like, right? I could do VO, right? And find it for a certain, as a function of, of some input voltage VS. And I can solve for that. That's one data point, right? But that's at a certain frequency. That could be at 60 hertz. But I could sweep the frequency. I could I could change the frequency to 70 hertz. I could change VS to 70 hertz and then check what the output will be. I end up with a collection of different outputs. So I have the frequency and I end up with a collection of different outputs at different frequencies that sweep across all different frequencies for a single variable that I'm solving for is what's called uh, the valuable variable frequency response analysis. I'm seeing how my circuit responds to variations in, in, in frequency. Right? And uh, uh, in the similar way where we analyzed impedance by, by first uh, looking at uh, the impedance of, of the fundamental elements and then jumping to combinations of them, uh, we could understand the frequency response by looking at the fundamental elements first, the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor. So, so if we understand the frequency response of those elements separately, we can deduce the frequency response, the result of sweeping, what results from sweeping the frequency due to combinations of these elements. So, so, uh, so, so in the similar in a similar way to how what we did to analyze impedance, we can apply the same method and uh, and and get get the frequency response of a complicated circuit from just knowing what how the, the elements themselves behave, the the, the elemental uh, uh, elements behave circuit elements. So let's start with the resistor. Right? Can, what happens if I sweep the frequency across a resistor? Right? The resistor has a, has a resistance of R, right? Nothing changes, right? R remains the R regardless of, of frequency. So if I, so ZR is just R, it's just some real uh, number. So if I plot the impedance of R with respect to frequency, an impedance is a complex number. So I could plot the, the real part, the imaginary part separately, or I could plot the magnitude and the phase. So if I plot the magnitude of ZR, it's, it's just going to be R, right? If I plot the phase, this is frequency versus magnitude. If I plot frequency versus phase of ZR, it's a real uh, value, so it's going to have a phase of zero. 
it's going to be down here, right, on the F axis. Right, so that seems trivial enough. The interesting frequency response occurs with actually inductors and capacitors. So we know that the impedance of an inductor is going to be what? J omega L. Okay, so this is more interesting because now omega appears in the value of the, of the, of the impedance. So the impedance is a function of frequency, it depends on frequency. And when we vary the frequency, we get different, different values for for the impedance. So this is J 2 pi 60 L. Uh, 2 pi, sorry, not 60, F. Omega is 2 pi F. Right? J 2 pi F L. Now we can plot this with respect to, we can plot the magnitude of the impedance of the inductor and the phase of the impedance of the inductor because the impedance is a complex value. Uh, complex value, we cannot plot it on, on a single plot. Uh, we need two plots. We can, we either can plot the real and imaginary part on two separate plots, or we plot plot the magnitude and the phase on two separate plots. Either way, we identify uh, 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 the complex number at every frequency uniquely if we know those two parameters: either real and imaginary components or magnitude and phase. That's how you represent or plot complex numbers. Now, uh, um, the phase is easy. The phase, is, we have J, so the phase, regardless of the frequency, we'll always have J. J is a phase of 90 degrees, right? So the phase will always be plus 90 degrees. And the magnitude is going to be what? It's going to be omega squared L squared square root. It's going to be omega L. That's said L magnitude, right? So this is going to be a line with a slope, straight line with a slope of L. Okay, so that, that's interesting. The, the higher the frequency, the more impedance we have. At zero frequency, at DC, of course, the impedance is zero, meaning that the, the, the inductor is a short circuit. Okay, uh, what about the capacitor? So the capacitor has an impedance. 1 over j omega c. The magnitude, of course, is 1 over omega c. And the phase of z of c is what? 1 over j is minus j, so it's minus 90 degrees. So if I plot this, I have plot the magnitude of the capacitor impedance with respect to frequency, I end up with a curve that looks like this. So I can see that for very high frequencies, the capacitor has less and less impedance, meaning that for very high frequencies, signals that are have a very high frequency, the capacitor is a short circuit. But for very low frequencies, and what's the lowest possible frequency? The lowest possible frequency is zero, which is DC, right? A DC fixed constant signal. So for a DC signal, the capacitor has infinite impedance. The impedance goes to infinity at when omega equals zero. As omega approaches zero, Z of C magnitude approaches infinity. And if infinite impedance is just an open circuit. So this confirms to us that the capacitor acts as an open circuit for very low frequencies or for DC. Okay, so that's the magnitude. It looks like this. Notice it's not linear. It's, it's like an inverse function. And then the phase is just going to be minus 90 degrees. So this is the phase of ZC. So in contrast to, an induct to the inductor, the phase is at minus 90 degrees instead of positive 90 degrees. Okay, so those are the simple elemental, the, the simple uh, circuit elements. What about if we have a combination of elements, a circuit essentially? So let's say we have an RLC circuit. We can still sweep the impedance, we can still, using the techniques so we already know, write the impedance as a function of frequency, right? Because we can write it directly, right? That E equivalent equals R, impedance of the resistor, plus the impedance of the inductor, which is J omega L, plus 1 over J omega L, right? This is the impedance of the uh, capacitor, C, 1 over J omega C. So this is 
again nothing new here I just throw it down the only thing is now I want to instead of considering my frequency to be fixed I want to sweep my frequency and examine how the impedance of this combined circuit varies with, with frequency right we could write a computer program or do it in MATLAB but but let's try to intuitively figure it out right and it all it takes is a bit of manipulation right so what we can do well first I want to do the Z equivalent right magnitude well I want to do the magnitude and the phase but let me let me combine both of them a little bit so what I can do is I can I want to get one complex number from all of this or 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 or, uh, or um, ratio of two complex numbers this would make calculating the magnitude easier right because then I can just calculate the magnitude of the numerator over the magnitude of the denominator it's harder to calculate the magnitude of this kind of thing uh, uh, actually what we could do is we could say this z equivalent equals r plus uh, take j upstairs so this becomes minus j so this becomes j omega l minus 1 over omega c this is one complex number so this is easy to do so the, the, the z equivalent magnitude is going to be what so going to be r squared plus omega l minus 1 over omega c squared square root uh, square root right and what about the phase of z equivalent the phase of z equivalent is going to be well it's an it's the angle right so it's it's a uh, uh, tan inverse of omega l minus 1 over omega c over r right that's that's what it is essentially uh, uh, So we can plot this. Let's plot. Let, let's try to intuitively figure out, without even plugging in numbers. Let's try to intuitively figure out what the equivalent magnitude is going to look like when we plot it with respect to frequency. Right. Uh, so I mean, omega is just two pi f. Okay. So we want to quickly plot this intuitively. <coughs> So what we could do is we could figure out what are the asymptotes of this curve. Meaning, although this is a complicated function, can we approximate it as, 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 as omega goes to infinity and approximate it as omega goes to zero? Right? We should be able to do that, right? As omega goes to infinity, this term goes to zero, right? And then we end up with square root of r squared plus omega squared l squared. So this term goes to zero. This term becomes much larger than the r term. The r term is constant. Well, I'm constant. Well, I'm 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 making omega approach infinity. R is maintained constant. So this term becomes much larger than this term. So we could ignore the r for high frequencies. So we end up with a magnitude of omega l. Right, so so at very high frequencies, the frequency, the magnitude with versus frequency approaches a straight line, a straight line with a slope of l. Okay, this is not the actual frequency response. This is the asymptote. This is what the frequency response approaches at high frequency. What about low frequencies? Well, for for low frequencies, this term approaches zero. It's the opposite. And this term is much larger, so we end up with with r squared plus one over omega squared c squared, right? But then this term becomes larger, much larger than r squared as as omega goes closer closer to zero. So we end up with square root one over omega squared c squared. We end up with one over omega c. So we end up with an inverse function. So the asymptote is an inverse function. So those are asymptotes. Those are the approximations of the function for omega going to infinity and omega approaching zero.
So this is approx approximation of, the, of this function for omega approaches infinity and for omega approaches zero. The actual uh, 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 response is going to be the actual uh, impedance with respect to frequency is going to be something that's a combination of those asymptotes. It's going to be something something like this. It's going to going to be closer to the inverse function for low frequencies. It's going to have a point of inflection, and it's going to get closer to the a linear asymptote as omega approaches infinity and it will have a minimum value at this minimum value can we deduce what this minimum value would be well that will be r right why because there's a certain there's a certain inter intermediate frequency where the, where this term this whole term equals zero meaning where omega l minus one over omega c equals zero this happens when omega l equals 1 over omega c which is omega squared lc equals 1 which is omega equals 1 over square root lc so at a frequency equal to 1 over square root lc by the way this is f not omega so this will be i want to turn the omega into f right so this is going to be 2 pi i need to multiply by 2 pi to turn the omega into f right at this frequency we will have the impedance equal exactly to r okay what about the phase well let's think about it so the phase of z equivalent what happens if omega goes very high if omega is very high this term is going to go to zero and we end up with omega l over r so we end up and omega is approaching infinity so this whole thing under tan inverse approaching infinity what angle has a tangent of infinity right we know what angle has a tangent of infinity we, we know what the tangent function looks like right so if i plot angle theta and degrees versus tan at 90 degrees the tan goes to infinity at, at minus 90 degrees the tan goes to minus infinity so the angle that has a tangent of uh, infinity is going to be 90 degrees so the asymptote at high frequency is going to be 90 degrees what about low frequencies well this omega 1 over omega c is approaching minus infinity and this is approaching zero so the angle that we approach at minus infinity the angle that has a tangent minus infinity is minus 90 degrees so the asymptote for low frequencies is minus 90 degrees so the uh, phase uh, uh, sweep the phase frequency response is going to look something like this it's going to match those asymptotes at low frequencies and at high frequencies but then those two curves need to meet somewhere so they're going to look like this so this is what uh, the phase response is going to look like notice that we did not do any any exact numbers we just intuitively figured out the shapes of the curves okay. we can manipulate z, z equivalent further to get a transfer function or to get a, a rational uh, a complex number i'll explain what the transfer function is later in, in, in this in this lecture right so z equivalent equals r plus j omega l plus one over j omega c you know, we could always try to combine this into a, in, into a single ratio of complex numbers. What we could do is we can multiply here. Uh, we could try to get the same coefficient, one o the, sa the same denominator, 1 over j omega c. And then r becomes multiplied by j omega c. I'm just multiplying here j omega c over j omega c and multiplying here j omega c over j omega c to get the common denominator and then i end up with plus j omega squared mm -hmm. j omega squared lc right plus one right. so so r j omega c and then and then and then uh, uh, j omega squared because j omega is repeated twice and then I have lc. Okay. So notice here that z equivalent or 
for this or any other example I could give you, tends because the impedance has j omega in it, whether it's a capacitor or an inductor, we tend to get rational functions of j omega. The z equivalent tends to be a function of j omega, right? And and it's would be a rational function of j omega uh, and powers of j omega because j omega is like very commonly occurs in those expression expressions. It's it's a it's a well established shorthand. Or short shortcut to write j omega as just a single single variable s. So this is a very common shortcut, and this is just a shortcut at this point. Instead of writing j omega everywhere, I just write s to represent j omega. Now, when we study the Laplace transform, this will have a deeper meaning because s will be the, what what we call the s domain. But at this point, we're not there yet. At this point, just think of S as a, as a, and this is all we need to think of it at this point. And still, it's still a very useful way of thinking of it this way. It's still very useful to think of it this way. It's not like it's a, it's a, it's a, a deficient way. We don't need the Laplace transform yet to understand the role of S, right? Right? S, S is just shorthand for J omega. What does it what does it tell us about the impedances? Well, R is just R. C using the shorthand C is instead of being one the impedance of C instead of being one over J omega C instead of J omega I write S so the impedance of C is going to be just one over S C. The impedance of L is just going to be instead of J omega L is going to be S L. This is just a shorthand at this point. And it turns out that when we deal with complicated circuits, when we calculate the equivalent impedance or any circuit parameter, really, uh, any 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 uh, output with respect to out, uh, to any input, we tend to get rational functions of the j omega, meaning we tend to get rational functions of s, and not just any rational function. Notice here we have one plus j omega squared plus R J omega C, which is one plus S squared LC plus R S C. We don't tend to get any rational function. We, did, we tend to get specifically rational polynomial functions, meaning functions that in the numerator and the denominator are polynomials of S, are functions that have S squared, S cubed, S whatever in them. So the most general function that we would get for, for a general circuit as a function of s, remember s is a shortcut for, for j omega, is going to be just a rational polynomial, meaning we will have a numerator and a denominator that are functions of s, and both of those are just going to be polynomials, meaning they will look something like this, it will be some constant coefficients, then sm, plus a m minus 1 s m minus 1 all the way to a 1 s plus a 0 over b n s n or n plus b n minus 1 s n minus 1 all the way to b 1 s plus b 0. This form occurs all the time and you will find out that it will happen all the time when dealing with linear circuits. It just arises naturally linear circuits. It just happens to be that we always get rational polynomials. And because instead of j omega we write, we, we substitute s, we get those rational polynomials as functions of s. Okay. Let's do an example. So we have this circuit. And give you the phasor input. But again, because we want to do a frequency sweep, we're not going to assume that this phasor input is at a fixed frequency. I'm not going to assume this is at 60 hertz. I'm going to assume that, hey, I'm, I can sweep the frequency. So it could be at any frequency. Mm -hmm. okay. But uh, I'm interested in, a, in, in trying to figure out what, the, what any circuit variable is going to be with respect to that sweeping of the frequency. So this is the circuit, simple circuit. So it's a capacitor. 2.53 millifarad, an inductor of 0.1 Henry's, and then a resistor 
for 15 ohms. And then I'm interested in, in figuring out what VO is going to be as a function of the frequency. Right? What, what VO is going to be as a function of J omega or S. And, and VS is allowed to vary with frequency. So it's, it sweeps. It's, it's, it's uh, dependent on, on frequency, J omega, which means it depends, it depends on S. Right? It's not a fixed frequency signal. So, so this is easy. This is V O S, right? It's just gonna be. I don't have to write uh, the S explicitly. Just write V O, right? It's understood that this is a function of frequency. We're sweeping the frequency. So this is just a voltage divider. This is this is R. V O is just R over the total impedance, which is R plus S L plus 1 over SC, you have to get used to this way of writing impedances instead of doing J omega. Right? It's equivalent, but it's helpful to get used to this manner of writing impedances. You should be able to jump easily between the, the J omega way of writing things and the S way of writing things. Okay, But that's it. That's, that's how VO varies with frequency, because, because VO is clearly a function of S. Right, so uh, we can rearrange this. Remember, we said that everything ultimately will look like a, a rational function of polynomials. How can we turn this into a rational function of polynomials? Just multiply numerator and denominator by SC. So I end up with SCR. This is a polynomial in the numerator, and then SC times one over SC is one. SC plus R times R is is SCR. SC times SL is S squared LC. This is clearly a polynomial divided by a polynomial. It's always preferable to write uh, uh, those, those rational functions in this form. Right? Now let's say we want to plot this response. So VS, what is VS? VS is 10, 0 degrees. We want to plot this response, right? So what we could do is instead of S, we can put in J omega. So this equals J omega times uh, uh, C. We know what C is and R is. So 2.53 times 15 gives me 37.95 milli Henry. So this has 10 minus 3 over S squared. LC is 0.1 times uh, uh, C, which is... 2.53 times 10 to the power minus 4 plus j omega, oh, this is j omega squared plus j omega 337.95 times 10 to the power minus 3 plus 1. Right? So now we have VO as a function of frequency times 10, of course. That's it. That's VO as a function of frequency. We can plug in multiple frequencies in here and get different VOs as a function of frequency. And the multiple frequencies that we plug in, will, like any frequency you plug in here, will give you a complex number. VO, of course, is a phasor. Right? So, so the traditional way of representing a frequency sweep is to, I mean, unlike a phasor diagram, we're not plotting the real and imaginary parts on a 2D plane. We want to plot, there's a third variable here, which is the frequency. So you, the, our x-axis has to be the frequency sweep, right? The omega. Let's, let's plot it with respect to omega. But because with, for different omegas, we have a complex number. A complex number has can be described by two numbers. It's magnitude and phase. So we need to do two plots. Right? So this is the magnitude of VO and the phase of VO. Right? So this kind of plot is, is, is what how we traditionally plot frequency response. Something else we do, people do, is, is uh, instead of plotting VO with respect to linear frequency, instead of doing a linear plot, it's much more information dense. We can, we can much more easily eyeball or, 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 or understand the frequency response. It, it, it is a more condensed way of plotting the frequency response. It's, uh, 
is rather than doing a linear plot, doing what's called the semi-log plot, meaning a plot where the x-axis is, instead of omega, we're plotting with respect to log omega. So instead of omega here, I'm plotting with respect to log omega. So up to this point, I mean, I mean, uh, the way we will plot this is we could evaluate this at different points. Let's say at a certain omega, I get a complex number here. I put its magnitude here and put its phase here. And then at another omega, I get another complex number. I plot its magnitude here. I plot its phase here. I, I, I plot a number of points, magnitudes and phases, and I get the response. And you could write a MATLAB program, MATLAB script to do that. I mean, I'm not giving you any way of plotting those right now, but but I mean, it's, it's a matter. Of, it's an easy matter to do it in MATLAB. Just you know, just do a for loop and and, and evaluate this at different frequencies. You get a multi set of points, and you can plot those points with respect to frequency. Right. So let's see how that plot would look like. So, so for this example, uh, the semi-log plot will look like this. Notice here we're plotting with respect to log omega. So this is a semi-log uh, graph meaning plot, meaning that the x-axis is log omega. So we start with 10 to the power 0, 10 to the power man, 1, to 10 to the power 2. Each step on the x-axis is an order of magnitude more 10 times more than the previous one. Right, so this represents 0, 1, 2. Right? Uh, and, and, and the actual frequency it represents is going to be 10 to the power 0, 10 to the power 1, 10 to the power 2. So it's traditional to, to label the ticks on the semi-log axis. So although this is log omega we could have what we could have done is we could say hey the x axis is log omega and this would be just 0 1 2 yes. right but it's traditional to just say hey this is omega and 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 and, and uh, represent the semi log nature of the x axis by writing 10 to the power 0 10 to the power 1 10 to the power 2 and so on and so forth right uh, notice here that the magnitude also is plotted as as the log of, of of the magnitude. So here we're plotting log v o magnitude. Okay. By while the phase is not is not logarithmic. The, the phase is just straight. The y axis is just linear. So this is what's called a, a log log plot. This is a linear log plot. But for this this uh, view that we calculated, this if we like plug it in MATLAB and, and, and plot for different frequencies, find what the magnitude and phase is, and connect between those dots, we end up with those two two graphs. Okay, so this is how 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 the frequency response is going to look like for this circuit. Notice that at lower frequencies. What happens at lower frequencies? The capacitor impedance goes higher, right? It's almost an, approaches an open circuit, right? So the impedance of this capacitor will be much higher than this R. So the voltage dwindles, right? It becomes lower and lower as we go smaller in frequency. Same thing happens as we go higher in frequency. The, cap the capacitor is a short. That's fine. At, as we go higher and higher frequencies, but the inductor impedance gets higher and higher as we increase frequencies, right? And it does the same thing then. The voltage due to the voltage divider, the, the ratio of R over the impedance is, is going to be approaching zero. So the voltage is going to also get lower and lower as the frequency increases. Right? There is a sweet spot here where the voltage is going to be maximum, which is going to happen at a certain frequency. And typically it happens at, at when omega equals 1, 
I mean, from the circuit, I could deduce it's going to happen when, because it's a simple RLC circuit, it's going to happen when omega equals 1 over square root LC. Right? I mean, the phase also, we can see what's happening here. For lower frequencies, the inductor is a short, the capacitor is, is, is uh, dominating, the impedance of the capacitance, the inductance is, sorry, not inductance, capacitance. The impedance of the inductance, uh, capacitance is much higher than the inductance. So we can ignore the inductance, and the impedance uh, of the capacitance has, has an angle of minus 90 degrees, right? Let's see what's happening here. Oh, but this is VO, sorry, forget about that. So, so we have to look at this function, actually, this equation. What happens when omega is, much, is, is, is very small? When omega is very small, we can ignore the 1. We can ignore the, the, if you have a small number and you square it, you get an even smaller number, right? So, so we can ignore the, the omega squared, this term. Uh, let me see. Right? So if you have omega squared, if you have omega that's very small, what's smaller? Omega squared or omega, if omega is approaches zero. If omega is approaches zero, let's say I have 0 0.1. 0 0.1 is, is larger than 0 0.1 squared, which is 0 0.01, right? So omega squared is much less than omega as omega approaches zero. So, so either way, as omega approaches zero, those terms are much smaller than one anyway. So I have 1 here, and I have j omega in the numerator, so j is an angle of 90. So that means we start at an angle of plus 90. Okay, no need to go that complicated. What happens as omega approaches infinity? As omega approaches infinity, the 1 becomes small, and we can ignore. The j omega becomes small, and we can ignore, compared to the j omega squared. Bigger numbers... For very big numbers, the square is much larger than the regular number, so this becomes dominant, and we end up with j omega over j omega squared, which is 1 over j omega, which is an angle of minus 90. So as omega goes to infinity, notice we're approaching minus 90 degrees. So this is the intuitive way to kind of understand how the uh, 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 waveforms, how the plots, the shape of the plots, right? But the exact values can be obtained just from plotting it using a computer. There, is, there are approximate ways of, of, of doing those plots without using a computer, and those are called body plots, which we will cover uh, uh, in a future lecture. I mean, they're nothing major. I mean, there's just a way to get those plots quickly without using a computer, because, I mean, people starting started doing those plots very early on, before even the invention of, of uh, a digital computer. Well, a digital computer that's capable of, 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 of plotting graphics like this. All right. An example, a practical example, where, where frequency response analysis is crucial in, in understanding the, the behavior of, 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 of the circuit. And this example, right, and this is a natural example. I mean, other, unlike power systems, where the, the voltage in the power system tends to be a fixed frequency, like the line is going to be always at 60 hertz, right? I mean, that will not change. So, so I mean, in power systems, I mean, I mean, understanding the frequency response might be dubious, Although it does have its applications, because because what happens is that typically in AC systems, power systems, the signals are not always pure sinusoids. Sometimes we have harmonics. We have high frequency components superimposed sort of on the signals. So so frequency analysis will still be useful to understand how the circuits and, and uh, power systems are gonna behave or respond to, to harmonics existing in, in the signals, right? But one clear example where, where, where clearly uh, AC uh, um, 
variable frequency response analysis applies, clearly applies, is, is audio circuits or audio amplifiers. Because, um, I mean, the ID of a microphone, right? A microphone is a device, it's a, like a membrane, it's a transducer, it's a device that takes in sound waves takes them in and converts them into electrical waves. So this is ST in volts, and this is T. Right, so, so sound waves get converted into, into electrical versions of those sound waves. Right, and they, are, they wiggle around and, and they vary, right? But the idea is that they are not kind of the sound signals that exist, I mean, that represent music or voices and so on and so forth, are not signals of fixed single frequency, right? They are signals that have multiple frequencies, right? So they exist across, across a bandwidth or a band of frequencies, or else we wouldn't have different tones, right? So, so sound signals tend to be complicated. They might look something like this, but from a frequency perspective, they consist of, of, of a certain band of frequencies. So they might go from, from 1, 10, 100, 1K, 10K. I'm using here a log scale, right? 100K, right? So the, they might ha vary at a certain range of frequencies, but typically they're not all over the place. Like, like Typically, um, how, I should, how, how shall I say this? Although sound waves could come at, at, at a wide range of frequencies, so we could have subsonic, we could have ultra sound. Ultrasound is, is sound waves that have a high frequency, right? but, but the range of frequencies that the human ear can hear is limited. We cannot, uh, sound frequency is also called pitch. So we cannot, we cannot hear a very high frequency and we cannot hear very low frequencies. There is a limit to what we can hear and the range is typically uh, from, from zero, not zero, sorry, 50 hertz to, to uh, 15,000 hertz, 15 kilohertz. And this is hertz not for an electrical signal, this is for a sound signal. It gets translated into electrical signal when, when we use a microphone, right? Uh, um, that's why uh, uh, in power systems, because we're running at 60 hertz, right? So that's why sometimes you, when, you, when, you, when you get close to a transformer, you hear humming. This humming is the 60 hertz signal because the, the transformer is, is, is vibrating due to the electrical signal, the ele electrical uh, uh, voltage are current going through it, right? And because it's higher than the minimum frequency that you could hear of 50 hertz, right? Uh, uh, you can still hear it. Right? Uh, of course, depending on, on your age, if you're younger, younger people can hear a wider range. So younger people can hear, I think, down to 25 hertz, perhaps, and up to close to 17, 18 kilohertz, perhaps up to 20, right? Animals can hear over a wider range. Many animals can hear, dogs can hear uh, higher pitches, for example. That's why, that's how a dog whistle works, right? You, 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 you blow on the dog whistle and, and it irritates the dog, but you don't hear anything. Right, so um, so yeah, so as an example, an audio amplifier. So an, 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 a circuit example would be having a microphone. I don't know how to draw a microphone. I just draw a membrane, and it turns it into an electrical signal. A microphone is gonna is gonna go into, into generate an electrical signal. With the, versus the sound signal, and it's going to go into an amplifier. And this amplifier is a circuit that needs to take the signal 
and 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 amplify it, make it bigger, right? And then process it and whatnot. And then it could be processed, and then later it can go into a speaker, whatever that is, you know, to to reproduce. The, the speaker turns the electrical signal into a sound signal again, vibration in the air. The idea is that the amplifier does not have to respond to any electrical signal. The amplifier has only to respond to 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 a certain range of frequencies. So if I plot the gain of the amplifier, this is the gain of the amplifier, it only has to give me some gain for this pertinent range of frequencies, the range of frequencies that I can hear here. And for the wider range of frequencies, the frequencies that I cannot hear, it's fine. The, the amplifier is okay for the amplifier to suppress the signal. And you want the amplifier to suppress the signal because typically noise arises at, at the higher bands, at the higher frequencies, right? So you want to kill that noise. So this amplifier would be like a circuit, some circuit, where, where the input voltage is the sound voltage, is the voltage that arises. And I won't draw it right as a phaser because it has multiple frequencies, right? So uh, typically a phaser is going to be just a single frequency, right? So this is VS, that is the signal that's generated from my microphone. The microphone picks the sound, generates VS. This amplifier takes VS and generates V out. V out is the amplified version of VS. Right? And the gain of the amplifier is represents, represented by the ratio of the output versus the input. So it's going to be VOS over VSS. So this is also going to be a function of S. Okay? And this is called the transfer function. It represents a circuit variable divided over an output circuit variable divided over an input circuit variable. It gives me an idea of how varying the input changes the output. It's the gain between the output and the input. Right? And we want to design this circuit to achieve this kind of frequency response. We want to achieve something where, where, where we, we pass the intermediate frequencies and we suppress the high frequencies and the low frequencies. One implementation of such a circuit would look like this. So I have VSS and this is, I mean, typically it's implemented in a, using transistors or operational amplifiers, but the equivalent behavior can be represented by such a circuit. So we have VS, we want to suppress low frequencies. One way of doing that is having a capacitor in series, right? The capacitor is open circuit at low frequencies. Because it's open circuit, it, 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 it kind of like suppresses the, it doesn't allow VS to pass at low frequencies. So this is CN. It has an impedance of 1 over SC, CN. And then we have uh, an input resistance of the amplifier. And this is Vn. This is the input of the amplifier. This could be your op amp or whatnot. And this we have. Then we have a dependent source. And this. Then we have the gain of the amplifier, Vn s. And then that goes into an output resistance. And then we want to kill high frequency signals. So we have a cap, one over SCO. At higher frequencies, this becomes a short, which shorts out the output. And this is now the output. That's VOS. So this is one, one circuit that represents an amplifier that has a frequency response that looks like this. And we can verify that it does indeed look like this. Right? Like what would GVS be in this case? It's going to be, well, it's VOS over VSS, which is equals VOS over uh, uh, VNS times VNS over VSS, right? I did nothing more than uh, uh, multiplied by VNS divided by VNS. So I divided I divided the problem of finding this transfer function, this this what's called the transfer function, the, the gain from one input variable to the output variable by getting 
by calculating two transfer functions. So what's V what's VNS VNS over VSS? Well, it's the circuit, right? So this is simply uh, it's a voltage divider. So it's RN over RN plus one over SCN V uh, SS. I write VSS here. No, there's no VS. Yeah, there's VSS, of course, but then I'm dividing by uh, right. So this is V and yeah, VSS. This is correct. This is VNS, by the way. This is this whole thing is VNS. I divide it by VSS because I'm dividing by VSS. This cancels out. So this would be the transfer function. And then the second transfer function is VOS over VNS, right? So, so, uh, so this is going to be A VNS, but then I'm dividing by VNS, so this cancels. And then I have the voltage divider. I have VOS is just 1 over SCO over 1 over SCO plus RO. And we said we always prefer to write those rational functions as, as, as ratios of polynomials. So we could write this in the traditional form as follows. Just multiply by 1 over, by, multiply by SCN both numerator and denominator, you end up with S R N C N over uh, uh, S R N C N plus one A and then multiply by one by S C O I end up with one plus S C O R O. I can further I prefer not to have the first coefficient being multiplied by a constant, so I can always divide by 1 over Rn Cn. Cn I end up with S, this is GVS, of, of, uh, divided by S plus 1 over Rn Cn. This is also another common way of writing transfer functions where you ensure that the highest power of S has a unity coefficient. This is just the traditional way of writing transfer functions. So this is, this is going to be 1 over C-O-R-R-O over S plus 1 over C-O-R-O. Aha! Now, clearly this part provides the, the low pass, what's called the high pass filtering, meaning it suppresses low frequencies and, and passes high frequencies. This part provides the low pass filtering, meaning it, it passes low frequencies and then suppresses high frequencies. The combination of those two gives me the band pass effect. Right? And we can see that this is a high pass filter and this is low pass filter. We can clearly see that. Why? Because at high frequencies, you know, remember S is G omega. So as omega goes to zero, right, this becomes much smaller than this. So I end up with S over one over R N. Cn, but S is going to zero because omega is going to zero. So this whole thing goes to zero as omega goes to zero. Right. So this is clearly suppresses low frequencies. So it's a high pass filter. Right. This, by the way, does not suppress low, low frequencies because as S as omega goes to zero, this becomes much smaller than this. I, I end up with one over. C-O-R-O -O divided by 1 over C-O-R-O, -O, I end up with unity, 1. So for sm small and intermediate frequencies, this is unity. This just passes the signal and applies gain A. But for high frequencies, S becomes much larger than this term, so I end up with 1 over C-O-R-O -O divided by S. Because I can, S becomes much larger than 1 over C-O-R-O. -O. So this, as omega goes to infinity, tends to 0 because it's like 1 over j omega. Omega is getting very high, so this whole term tends to 0.
So this provides me the low pass effect where at high frequencies, I suppress high, frequ high frequencies and I pass intermediate and low frequencies. This is how you impl implement uh, an audio amplifier that has bandpass filtering. Okay. So this introduces the concept of, of a network transfer function. So I have a certain input to the network, VI, S, and I have a certain output, POS, and then I can express the ratio of the output versus the input as a transfer function. And can easily calculate those transfer functions for different circuits. Okay, there are different kinds of transfer functions. So there are the what's called the voltage gain. This is a transfer function from input voltage to output voltage. So it has a unit of V over V. So this is what's called a voltage gain. You could have a current gain. You could have transfer function between an input current to an output current, I-O. So this is going to be amp over volts. So Z can be written as ZS. You can write anything, right? And then there's what's called the trans... Uh, uh, oh, this is... So amp over amp, sorry. Then there's what's called the trans impedance gain. Right? Which is uh, uh, volt over amp. Right? So, so the output is a voltage and the input is a current. GIS. And then there's what's called the trans conductance or trans uh, admittance. Sometimes people say transconductance, it's the same thing. Transadmittance gain, which is amp over volt, which where in this case, your output is an ampere current and your input is a voltage, right? And any general transfer function can be represented just generally as H of S, T of S. You know, if you don't wanna specify what kind of input and output it is, can just use a general uh, capital letter uh, uh, to represent a, a transfer uh, a transfer function. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we want to do an example. Um, yeah, I think we are out of time. I think I'll leave this example for for next time. And, and uh, we'll continue this discussion uh, next time. Thank you, guys.